Okay, shalom nukulam. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Begin Center Zoom. Uh, this is the second in a special series that we're doing in collaboration with the JISS, uh, the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Um, the I, I should say, for those of you that weren't here for the first one that we did two weeks ago, um, we uh, this was planned uh, a couple of months ago at least, so before the events of uh, October 7th. Nevertheless, of course, those events will inevitably um, play into the, 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 kind, the discussions that we're going to have and the topics that we'll be discussing. Certainly the last one, which was very specifically about um, the situation and, and, and Gaza and Hamas. Um, but also, as, we'll, as you'll see, um, the conversation this evening, um, which um, was always going to be relevant in a general sense, is now, I think, more relevant than it was. Um, so we'll, um, well, I'll introduce um, our guests momentarily. For those of you who are new to this format, how this is going to work is um, I'm going to be in conversation with our guests for about 30, 40 minutes, and then I will turn over to questions from you, which you can write into the chat box at the bottom of the, your screen, and I will um, um, choose some of those to put to our guest. Okay, so um, we we are joined uh, today, this evening, if you're in Israel this evening, um, and we're very privileged to be joined by Professor Hillel Frisch, uh, who is a, a noted expert on the Arab world, Professor Emeritus at Bar Ilan University, a former senior researcher at the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies, uh, amongst his latest work is uh, Rethinking the Arab Spring, Winners and Losers, and the Palestinian Military 201, uh, which may be relevant for today's conversation. Uh, he has a BA from Tel Aviv University, a Master's in International Relations from Columbia, and a PhD uh, from the Hebrew University. Um, Professor Frisch, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so we're going to be discussing today the, the future of the Palestinian Authority, which, as I said, is always a relevant topic because of the um, obviously the, the importance of the Palestinian Authority in terms of um, what happens in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, um, and its relations with Israel, whether they are good or less than good, depending on what's going on. Um, but it's 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 a particular, I think, importance right now um, because I think um, perhaps more important now than ever before is the question of the relationship between the Palestinian Authority and and uh, and Fatah, the, the party that, that runs the Palestinian Authority, and Hamas. Uh, uh, so, uh, it, for a first sort of opening question, could you tell us how you see? Uh, well, I guess the general question of, of the, the state, the current state of the Palestinian Authority, and maybe specifically relating to the current situation um, and the relationship between uh, the PA and Hamas. Okay. Um, basically, um, what, did, what I wanted to begin with was to try to explain why it is that um, in Judea and Samaria, which is 10 times the size of of Gaza and um, one third more populous, we sort of contained um, terrorism. It's a livable terrorism, and it's a terrorism that at most demands maybe half a battalion even to get to the worst areas, um, such as Jenin or, um, or Nablus, as opposed to um, Lilliputi and um, Gaza, where, which, uh, where um, we were devastated with 1,450 deaths in one day, and um, we had to, we needed um, basically 100,000 troops before coming, before coming in, and um, our whole economy is in deep freeze, and half the population is not being, is not being educated. What explains that difference? Why, why, why can we live with the, uh, with the Palestinian Authority? And, um, and something so terrible happened in Gaza. Now, um, often people say things are com complex, but the answer to this is very simple. And it dates back to 2002. In 2002, at the height 
of this, what's erroneously called the Second Intifada. It's basically, it was basically Arafat's war against um, Israel. Israel um, defined two different policies completely, one towards Judea of Samaria, the West Bank, and the other to Gaza. Um, when, when at, at the height of terrorism, at the height of terrorism, Israel decided to act offensively against Judea, against the Palestinian Authority. It reconquered the cities, and ever since, it conducts penetrating um, raids where we basically snare most of the terrorists before they commit the crime. It's called preventive arrest. It's probably the most single most important um, variable which explains why we can contain terrorism in Judea, in, in, in um, the Palestinian Authority. In other words, we acted offensively. In, in Gaza, as opposed to that, there was no reconquering of, of, of Gaza, even after the missiles began in 2001. In fact, we did quite the opposite. We withdrew from Gaza in 2000, in 2005. And in other words, instead of a policy, an offensive policy, um, which we applied to the Palestinian Authority, we took a policy of containment, which is basically a defensive policy. What's, what's the key difference? The key difference is that in the offensive, the preventive arrest, we hit at the capability of the terrorists every single day in Judea and Samaria, every single day. The most boring item in the news is the most important. How many how many terrorists and would-be terrorists were rounded up that night, that night um, um, in, 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 Judea, in, in the Palestinian Authority? As opposed to that, in Gaza, we did almost nothing to prevent the growth of their capabilities. At the beginning, at the beginning, after we we withdrew in 2007, after Hamas took over, took over, um, uh, Netanyahu began by trying to be more offensive. He conducted three rounds against the Hamas in 2008, 2012, and 2014, and it was working. It was really hitting at the capabilities of Hamas. And in the last round, we achieved three and a half years of quiet. And then he made the crucial mistake. He and all the top brass in the army, except for two heroes of the day, which, which I, um, I'll identify. identify. Um, they, Hamas tested us in November 2018. And instead of hitting back, and hitting back very hard, Netanyahu basically adopted, in addition to a policy of containment, a policy of taming Hamas. The belief that he can change the mindset of Hamas through, through basically gifts. What were the gifts? Money from Qatar, opening the labor market to Gazans once, once again, allowing allowing the leaders of Hamas freely to, to fly to, to get to Egypt, to go to Qatar and spend their time in six-star hotels. In six-star hotels, this was all part of the program that, that the leadership will be corrupted and will get used to the good life and therefore give up their very, very basic design to destroy to destroy Israel, but that and and from 2018, we did nothing to stop the capability of of Hamas. And now it's very clear that all that all the that they did around the fence, including the balloons and including j j sending young children to, um, towards the fence to cross the fence was to discover the weaknesses uh, in, that, in, in that fence. It was all a master mind intelligence operation in which they identified 80 dead points 
along this supposedly very sophisticated fence. The belief that fences, the belief that fences um, can can contain an enemy, that the human can't overcome the fence, is is absolutely false. I used to see it living in Malaya Dubin and driving to at five thirty in the morning to avoid the cut the, the to avoid the traffic to Barilan University. I used to see at six o'clock in the morning, um, um, Tarzan, uh, you know, um, young workers who wanted to work in Israel, jumping over a five meter fence, clearing the barbed wire for 200 meters. And that's what I used to see. And we all know what that, what the fence is worth, even in Judea and Samaria. Um, the very fact that we were being told that there were 100,000 official um, workers from from the Palestinian Authority working in Israel and 50,000 unofficial. What is 50,000 unofficial? These are people that cross the fence either daily or at least weekly. So how much could, can a fence, can a defensive action work? And we got it and we learned the lesson badly. Badly, we cannot contain, we cannot contain our enemy who lives so close to such vulnerable strategic points in Israel. That's, that's it. And the same can be said, uh, or even in greater measure, to Hezbollah, which means that after the Hamas operation, logically, from a strategic point of view, from, we have to go after Hezbollah, which is by far the greatest danger. Now, I've been discussing with you, all of this is technical, that they adopted a policy of containment towards Gaza and an offensive strategy towards, towards the, um, the Palestinian Authority. And that explains the difference in the levels of, of threat and, 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 and terrorism. But what is the root? What is the root of this problem? The root of this problem is moral decay. The belief of the Israeli elite, both the military and the political elite, that the Israeli society was not willing to accept losses. This is the true, this is the true reason. We went towards technology, and I, I certainly think that there has to be a mix between defensive technology and offensive wherewithal. But, but to go after exclusively to change the Israeli defense forces from, from the 50s, 60s, 70s, where it was the most offensive army in the world, to an army that seemed like it wasn't ready to attack anything was a, was a very, was a very, very, um, a very bad, very bad mistake, mistake. So that's the first part I, I wanted to say. The second about the Palestinian Authority, especially in its emphasis on, on Gaza, because that's, um, first of all, the Palestinian Authority is a huge enterprise. It spends, its expenditure is, is, runs to $5.2 billion a year. That's much more than many states in the world. And it dwarfs any other institution in the, in the, in the West Bank, Judea, and Samaria. Just to give you an example, the biggest firm in, the biggest non-state firm in, 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 in the Palestinian Authority is Paltel, which employs 5,000 workers. Well, the Palestinian Authority employs 135,000 employees. And they represent around 30% of the, of, 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 of the workforce, the workforce. That $5.2 million is about, billion dollars is about 70% of total GDP. So the Palestinian Authority is a huge, is a huge uh, oper uh, operation, is a huge operation. Now, at the beginning, after they lost Gaza, they, I, whether they knew the adage of the, of the, of the Jewish sages or not, Shebal Amea, Shebal Amea, 
that the person who has the money also makes the decision, but they tried. They tried reigning in Hamas using that money. But by 2014, they gave up. And basically, basically, they were spending at least $2 billion in Gaza a year. They kept Israel, um, they kept Gazan society afloat. And this relieved Hamas of its civil responsibility towards the civilians. And it could, it could now specialize very much like the, jihad, the Islamic Jihad purely in military buildup. In the military, we didn't realize, we didn't realize this, tra uh, this, uh, this trans, uh, this transformation. And it was, and it was very telling. They could now spend the, the, well, until 2013, they were making around $300 million from the smuggling routes between Egypt, between Egypt and, um, and, and, um, Ga and Gaza. But, that all ended with Assisi's rise to power, and he realized that Hamas was doing business with Islamic, with the Islamic State in Sinai, and also supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. And he decided that Hamas was even more that that destroying these smuggling tunnels was even more important than having Hamas bleed Israel, which was always an objective of the bid. Of the uh, 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 of the Egyptians, he closed, and then unfortunately, in 2018, Netanyahu. I, I mean, I'm not saying Netanyahu. The the whole breath, except for two people, um, um, Lieberman, Vigdor Lieberman, who resigned as a minister of defense against this against this taming policy, and there's also Dichter from the Likud who was the former head of the Shabak, he was always, a, they were really against this taming. He invited Kata to spend $30 million a month. $27 million of that went to Hamas. $3 million went to support the 100,000 devious people in Gaza who got one, a $100 check every three, every three, every three months. Well, that 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 twenty seven thousand um, dollars it was exactly the amount of money that you needed to employ the twenty thousand um, um, uh, um, employ Hamas employees and the thirty thousand men in arms in 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 in, um, in in Gaza, and so basically there was a symbiosis. Which is very, very, very important. Hamas got the Palestinian authority to underwrite all its, all the governance, the basic governance of, 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 of Gaza. It got, it, and it got Hamas to, to, uh, it got Qatar. And, and I want to say something about Qatar. It got Qatar to subvene the, the military apparatus. And of course, there were the Iranians who were willing to put in money to to um, enhance to enhance um, Hamas, Hamas um, capabilities. Uh, that's about that's about the basic story between the Palestinian Authority and and um, and God. That brings me to the third part. Okay, what's going to happen after Israel after Israel? Um, Hopefully defeats Hamas. There's no reason why it shouldn't be able to do so, and and fairly and fairly um and fairly easily. Well, um, you know there there are a couple of options out there. International an international force, um, from the precedents of southern Lebanon. I want to remind you that according to Resolution 1701, the UNIFIL with its thousands of soldiers. Are supposed to keep out Hezbollah from from 20 kilometers to the border. Well, all of you have seen in the last month how Hezbollah placed map placed um flags 
not only of Lebanon, of Iran, smack 50 yards from, from Israeli, from Israeli, Israeli positions. It's, it's, it's just a joke. No international force, no mercenary soldier, which they are, is going to, is going to risk his life to, to save the Jews. It just doesn't go, it doesn't go that well way. What do they begin to do? A symbiosis. And they begin living, living with it. The Palestinian Authority. There are those who say, you should bring the Palestinian Authority back, uh, together with, with, um, an international, with an international force. Um, Fatah is so discredited in Gaza because between 2002 to its ouster to 2007, there was a civil war between between the security agencies and the Tanzim and the Fatah Tanzim that the Gazans will never forget. I mean, it it was it it, it was Ava. Um, the Gazans voted in Hamas not because they loved Hamas, but they were so happy in the elections in the 2006 election to get rid of. To get rid of um, Fatah and the, P and the PA, so it's going to be very difficult. I, I'm not even sure that you'll find many Palestinian Authority um, officials who are, will risk their lives to go there. And the moment they go there, they'll make deals, paying off, and paying off the jihadists who re who who remain. And there's no doubt about it that Hamas will have sleeping cells for after the defeat. There's um, um, the head of my my institute, the JISS. Um, he counsels maybe turning Gaza into Somalia. We'll live with chaos. At least with chaos, you divide the Palestinians and um, and and you prevent anyone really powerful from emerging. That's a very also a very difficult very difficult option because um, in chaos. You can easily lob, you can easily lob, um, mortar fire. A mortar fire kills and mortar fire keeps people from, from remaining in Otep, in, in, in the envelope, in the Gaza envelope. Not very, um, really the only, the only solution, the only solution is applying the solution in the, in, in, in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. To Gaza. That means daily policing, if you can, and probably in Gaza, since it's more, much more difficult, given, given the dense, the urban density of Gaza, you'll just simply need every year or two massive entrance into Gaza to repress it. I want to end on this very, very happy note. <laughs> um, there is a famous poster that was brought out in 1956 on the eve of the Sinai, the Sinai, um, uh, uh, the Sinai offensive, where Israel, where Israel joined forces with the colonial powers, um, France and England. The kibbutzim, the kibbutzim, uh, like Nir Oz, Alumin Be'eri, who were very leftist, ideologically opposed the offensive. So the, the, the Israeli, the, the, the IDF brought out a poster I, I, um, saying that you suffer from terrorism and you suffer, and it's the same places that we're in are today. You can look at this poster and you could just believe that it was printed yesterday, literally yesterday. So, I mean, Aldous Huxley wrote, I listen in Gaza and we're just going to be left with Gaza. There is no, there, there is no solution, but as long, but as long as we hit at the capabilities of the people who want to destroy us, we'll be able to contain it to a, a level which will allow this, which will allow continued settlement in, 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 in the, in the, in, in, in the, um, Israel, in the Gaza, Envelope, which to me is crucial, because if we if we can't bring back the, the, uh, if we can't bring back the residents 
of Otep, Otep Aza or in the north, we're going to begin to lose territory. And, and in, from that point of view, this is a war of, of, um, of existence. As, um, as Netanyahu um, defined it, defined it, many, many um, query that, but I think because of the because of that implication, it is really uh, a, a war of existence. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of information there, a lot for us to think about um, and worry about, perhaps. <laughs> um, but I, let me um, let me follow up with a question. You you talked about how unpopular the PA are in Gaza. Um, from my understanding, they're not that much more popular in the West Bank, and the and and the reason um, the reason why Mahmoud Abbas uh, cancelled or postponed indefinitely the elections of what two three years ago was because he was pretty sure he was going to lose. So, um, can you tell us something about the the Pop, the lack of popularity of of Fatah in in the West Bank amongst Palestinians in the West Bank, why that is, and what that um, and what that um, uh, might uh, portend for the for the future. Um, I, I, I they might not have won the election, Fatah, but they certainly are the second biggest party. In, in in or the second biggest faction mm. in 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 um, the West Bank in 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 the Palestinian Authority, as opposed to Gaza, where they're really a minority. So so um, even in in the, the the free elections that are conducted in the union and in the in the university, they're a close second behind mm. behind Hamas, and sometimes they even defeat defeat Hamas. But basically, the Palestinian Authority has 10,000 fighters. I mean, a, a, a ten, as a security force of 10,000 10, trained, trained by, um, by American generals. The first was Keith Dayton in 2007. These people by now are already 15 years at least into accumulating, accumulating, um, pension, pension rights. They're not going, they have families, they're not going anywhere. They're dedicated to the Palestinian authority. And as it, and, and of course, um, they're backed by the Israelis. I, I just want to make, want to make it clear. Basically, um, there are six to seven thousand arrests made every year in, um, Judea and Samaria, much more in the last, in the last two years. 75% of those arrests are made by the Israeli forces, 25% by the Palestinian Authority. There's basic, a basic division of labor. The Palestinian Authority operates by day and Israel operates, Israel operates, um, by night, by night. Um, it, um, they have a common, they have a common enemy. So as long as Israel's in the picture and Israel will remain in, in, in the picture, um, in, in the, in, in the Middle East, nothing is decided by election. I mean, the last, the, the only, the only democracy that emerged from the Arab, from the Arab, um, uh, spring of 2010, 2011 has now succumbed to a dictatorship that it has never known before. And who, who runs that dictatorship? A former con professor of constitutional law. This is that, Tunisia? Well, yeah, Tunisia. Uh, Tunisia. So, you know, the, the Palestinians, if, if the Americans, if the Americans in Israel, if the Israelis chiefly, and then the Americans want the Palestinian authority to continue to exist, um, there's enough power there, vested power, in the Palestinian Authority to to keep it to keep it alive. There's even uh, to me a, cl a clear cl two clear successes. Um, his his name is Hussein Sheikh. He was he was even in his student days, even in his Fatah days, a rival of Mawana al the 
the more popular Fatah, Fatah leader. And he works with a person by the name of Majid Faraj, who's the head of general intelligence. And he's basically the United States man in the Palestinian, Palestinian uh, authority. And, you know, after the debacle in Gaza, the Israeli, the, the Israeli, um, deep state, the Israeli, um, military brass and political brass are not, are not going to allow through election a Hamas, a Hamas takeover. But that, of course, that, of course, prevents also the establishment of a Palestinian state because, because the Palestinian Authority lives on the bayonets of Israelis. And it's only because of the daily penetration, daily penetration that, that, that nevertheless it remains alive. And once you have sovereignty, it's, that kind of intrusion becomes very, very, um, complicated. Right. So, right. So as you, what you're saying is that the, that without the IDF there, the, 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 the PA would fall, right? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, uh might, might fall. Right, my fault. It, 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 um, it won't fall as easily as it fell in, in Gaza. Gaza. I, I, I think there will be prolonged civil war. Right. Um, um, because both sides will, will be, will be, will be strong. I mean, there's enough, there's enough, um, but the Israelis guarantee it. Um, just, I'll, one more question from me and then, then I'll go to some of the questions that are coming in from the audience. Um, what about um, the, the, um, before, um, October 7th, one of the big stories, of course, was the, were the, the burgeoning ties between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And there was this big question as to the extent to which, um, the Saudis under, uh, Mohammed bin Salman really cared about the Palestinian issue, um, or whether they were just paying lip service to it. Um, and there were some who said, well, if it's po if there is the possibility of some kind of um, normalization or, or whatever between Israel and the Saudis, then um, it could actually benefit if the Palestinians played their cards right, they could actually it could benefit them because they could work with the Saudis and have the Saudis as some kind of guarantor of of uh, like greater stability in 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 the West Bank. Or that kind of thing, and 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 it could actually help them to uh, to uh, maybe not statehood straight away, but but some kind of progress in the direction that they would want. Do you see? I mean, obviously, right now things are on hold with the Saudis anyway, and we don't know for how long. But if though, what if and when though that restarts, how do you see the Palestinian Authority's role in that in those? In, in that whole question of an Israeli-Saudi peace? Um, I'll, I'll begin by saying that the Entente, or the, the um, potential re relationship of normalization between Saudi Arabia and, and Israel basically rests on Iran, you know, staving off Iran. Mm -hmm. Iran um, is, a, is a greater threat to Saudi Arabia, or even more so, than it is than it is to than it is to Israel and um, and if we're forceful in Gaza and then if we're forceful once again against Hezbollah certainly the the Saudis will be able to 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 um, make make a deal um, uh, whether it'll bring to statehood I mean I I mean that that's not an issue that is going to be that is, that is going to be decided between states. It's right. an issue. I mean, Israel is a democracy. And it's going to be issue, and it's going it's going to be an issue that's decided in Israeli in Israeli um, in Israeli election. Huh. Um, so, I, I, certainly, if the if the Palestinians play their cards play their cards right, if 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 the Israel Palestinian society is able to create a new political uh, party, um, and 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 that party is 
purely civilian, who doesn't have a militia, or is not exclusively a, 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 a militia, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it might bring the center, the, the center, the Israeli um, center to into the hands of the more left um, pro um, state statehood and 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 certainly, but that's it's a it's a big if, it's a big if. Um, so it's 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 very hard to tell. There are too many too many ifs. There are too many um, ifs here, and um, I don't think it's I don't think it's the the key issue facing um, Saudi um, Israeli Israeli relations. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, there's a few questions coming in. I, I'll um, ask everyone to uh, keep those questions coming. Um, so there were a couple of questions I'm going to tie together here. Uh, Shmur Yerushalmi asks about the possibility of um, building, of Israel building or developing or cultivating a different local leadership in the territories, an alternative the Palestinian Authority. And related to that, maybe, is a question from Jacqueline about um, Salam Fayyad and whether Salam Fayyad could make a return. And the reason why I'm connecting them is because, because Salam Fayyad was this sort of technocratic um, Palestinian, uh, I think, prime minister and finance minister um, who had a good relationship with Washington and who was very much sort of separate from the... Um, the, the uh, the sort of Palestinian nationalist movement in many ways. Um, and so is that, so it, could you answer both of the questions? Is, is that a possibility? And could someone, could Fayyad or someone like Fayyad be part of that? Well, um, Israel has, Israel has uh, had a bad history in trying to cultivate, right. <laughs> in trying to cultivate a leadership. In Lebanon, um, they hope that, uh, that, uh, that, that, Christian Lebanon would produce a would produce um, a leadership that could make peace in with Israel and uphold the integrity of um, of Lebanon that failed failed miserably. Um, Israel tried once again to do that in 1992 in the Camp David um, in the Camp David process um, when it tried cultivating a local leadership as opposed to the as opposed to the PL, PLO. Um, and, and then there's, of course, the American experience in Iraq, um, which I think is not a failure, but it's certainly not a, a great success. And so, it, I, I mean, the Israeli leadership and it, it doesn't, have, doesn't have a lot of belief in, 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 in the ability, in the ability to engineer, to engineer a, a, a leadership. And, and I think, I think it, it, I, I think this disbelief is really grounded in reality. It has to come from the Palestinians, from the Palestinians themselves. And so far, um, it's been a total failure. Yeah. I mean, we've been with the same people. I, I, Hamas seems to be something new. It's no longer new because it was created in 1988. Um, but Hamas is really the extension of the Muslim Brotherhood that has existed in Gaza since 1946. And then you have the Fatah, who's already, um, um, what is it? I'm bad in my mathematics. Um, 60 years, 60 years old. Um, it doesn't seem to be a very innovative society when it comes, um, to politics. Uh, it, I, regarding Fayyad, I think his exit tells it, tells it all. I mean, um, this Hirschman almost got a Nobel Prize. He might might have gotten it with his exit voice and not loyalty. You can always, um, regarding any kind of um, political establishment, you can decide whether you'll be loyal. Um, uh, you can do boy, protest or you can leave. He left. Um, so I, I would assume that he felt that he had very, very, that he had a very, very small um, possibility of really changing things beyond the te technocratic, the tech. In the be it all and end all, you have to de develop a political, institutional, legitimate machine. It's not enough to be a technocrat. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, there's a question here. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the your name. I just see a, I see an email address of uh, uh, jellyesri at gmail.com. I don't know a name, but that's I've got the email, the email address there. Um, and it's a question about um, if Israel is propping up the PA and the PA depends on that status quo of Israel essentially propping it up militarily, um, is it the case that that actually um, Palestinian sovereignty in the West Bank and Judea and Samaria is something that even the even the PA wouldn't want because it would it because it's it would that would be the end or that would threaten its its existence. Yes, that certainly seems to be the case. Um, for, judging from um, Abbas's behavior, I mean, uh, Abbas was it, it, it was offered the Annapolis the possibility of of, of continuing the peace process towards um, towards statehood, and um, he, he basically turned it down. And I think he turned it down. He, he turned it down um, because. Because he felt that um, this this basic that this arrangement is is basically the the safest and most and and most convenient um, convenient relationship that that they that they could possibly um, possess. It has the perks, or it had the perks. I mean, Mahmoud Abbas appeared. I was invited to the. I, I I made a study of this. He was invited to the White House more so than most le leaders in the international world. I mean, almost to the level of British and uh, the British Prime Minister and 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 certainly the French Prime Minister. <laughs> I, I I mean, it was just rosy. I mean, in in the past decade, that has that has declined as the Palestinian authorities aura. Has, uh, has declined, but it's still and and Abbas never really was um, interested in Gaza during from from 1993 to 2005 when they were ousted. He made one trip huh. to Gaza in 2004, and um, he he got out of there by the by the skin of his teeth. He was um, attacked. By Hamas, Hamas forces, and um, that was it. He's not very interested in Gaza, in in Gaza e either. Um, of uh, of course, we. Um, he's 85 years old, and people don't live don't live forever. Um, as I'm getting that towards advanced age, that's really seems very very sad. But that's but that's true. And um, so he's not going to do he's not going to do anything. And I think this Hussein al Sheikh and Majid Faraj, um, a, a political a political personality, a Fatah personality, and a, and a security professional, they're going to, I, I I think they're going to keep the status the status quo. The status quo suits them as mm -hmm. well. It's a very problematic um, status quo, and and. You, you, you know, and to pass verdict on the Palestinian Authority is very difficult. On the one hand, they promote terrorism. I mean, the people, the people who shechted, who slaughtered the Israelis, the, the Israelis on the seventh. Um, once this is over, once the war will be over, they will be receiving those who survived, who their families, or, or those who are oh, dead. It doesn't even matter. Will be receiving ten thousand one hundred forty-four shekel a month from the Palestinian Authority by law. This is what uh, the, the people who took part in the in as as imprisoned terrorists or as dead terrorists, their families are going to be catapulted from an average income of around one thousand five hundred to two thousand shekelim to ten thousand. On the other hand, on the other hand, everyone I assume who's listening to me now travels on Route Six. In other words, on the begging, the begging highway, um, Route Six. Now, um, it, it would be very easy for terrorists to lob, to lob uh, mortars onto this major highway. It's never happened. Why has it never happened? Partially. 
I mean, mainly because Israel is operating on the other side, but also because the Palestinian Authority keeps a very tight, uh, a, 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 a very tight um, uh, to prevent to prevent. There hasn't been one incident in the last. Right. So, so it, 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 it's it's very difficult. It's very difficult that the Palestinian Authority today has a prime minister that I would say is no better ideologically towards Israel, no better than Sinwar or or um. He's, he's so, for him, Zionism, Judaism is Nazism. <laughs> and, um. Who we talk, can you say the name? Sorry, can we get that? Get, we, let's make sure we all know who we're talking I'm about. Saying. Right. Well, he, he's a former um, professor of economics at right. the Jassy University in Nablus. Right. Um, and just to be clear for everyone, I assume people know, but just to be so that everyone's on the same page, this is not. This is the prime minister doesn't run the show, right? Mahmoud Abbas is the is the president of the Palestinian Authority and, and is running it, but obviously the the prime minister is a very important figure. Um, so there's a question um, from Shmuel, who he he brings up uh, an idea which is sort of which pops up from time to time, which is the the proposal of a of a Palestinian Jordanian confederation um, as as a as some kind of solution to the problem. Um, can you just give your view on whether that's in any way realistic? And maybe you could, maybe just to expand on or piggyback on that question, if you can tell us something about the relationship between Jordan and the Palestinian Authority, because that, of course, is also very interesting, given the history of, of Jordanian occupation of the West Bank and then Jordanian claims on the West Bank right up until, what, 88, well, 87, 88, right? King Hussein renounced claims. So if you could um, say something about that. So I, I think in the long term, that's the only potential solution. The Palestinians are simply not strong enough in relationship to Israel to force Israel to give up, to give a Palestinian state. They're just living, mm. living in, an, in, in an illusion. They're just not, I mean, they're not going to get it. And, um, and the greatness of, of, of a Palestinian, a Palestinian Jordanian uh, federation is that the Palestinians are given an exit to the world, an exit to the Arab world, to the Muslim world, and and basically and basically to the, to the world. Um, but right now, there's nothing. There's no. I I think in the end, I mean, in 20 years, 30 years, I mean, the Palestinians are finally going to uh, are going to give up and and going to accept it. But right now, right now, there are no there are no takers. It's very interesting to point out that the that the Jordanian severed relation, it's called Fakir Ali Hibat in 1988, um, with the West with the West Bank, but in the Constitution, the 1952 Constitution, which has never been revised, mm. um, the West Bank is still part of Jordan. Mm. The, the the king the king who lives day by day. He keeps all the options open, including a kind of solution, solution, um, solution like that. But right now, um, I, I can't say that there's any popular following for the Jordanians in 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 in, 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 in the Palestinian Authority. Right. Um, so there was a question from um, Jonah Pressman. Um, so. He was wonder. He actually asked um, what I think is probably I think he I think by his own admission a very out of the box question about the possibility of um, Israeli Israeli Arab members of Knesset who define themselves as Palestinians being somehow uh, involved in 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 Palestinian in the Palestinian Authority in, in sort of he says. Um, um, uh, being a not Arab knights in shining armor um, in the Palestinian Authority, but I mean, wh whether or not that's the case, maybe you could say something about the the relationship, such as it is, between those leading members of Knesset like Ahmed Tibi and others who define themselves as Palestinian and have spoken out very forcefully against Israeli operations against Palestinians in the past, and the Palestinian Authority. You mean um, the thesis that they are the bridge, uh, 
how much they can be the potential bridge to peace? Or, no, I think uh, the question, I think Jonah is asked, I think Jonah is actually proposing that they would actually step in and become and sort of sort of move, essentially move from Israel to the West Bank and become part of the uh, become sort of a potential successors to to Mahmoud Abbas. Oh, no way. No way. They might. These people might protest against Israel and and condemn Israel at every corner, but they know that they live in the first world. And they're not willing, and they're not willing to go to the, the third world. This was, this was, of course, Lieberman, a big door Lieberman's proposal right. when he said, "We'll move the border. We'll move the border. We won't move the the, the people." And there was a survey taken um, following his proposal, and eighty percent of Israel's Arab population voted to be with the Jews. I mean, that's it. Most people, you know, people can be ideological and there are minorities in every society that are totally ideolo ideological. But most people are a mix of ideology and pragmatism. And these people say, in pra pra I, I mean, Israeli Arabs are known as being rich in, 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 the, Arab, in, in the Arab world. They don't want to give us, they don't like us um, often enough, but they, they don't want to part with us either. Right. Um, it's a question from Eric uh, Pasterman here, who it's a bit of a, it, it's digressing a little from the main topic, but I think it's, it's, it's good for us to sort of um, make, make use of your expertise while we have you. Um, given, uh, it's a question about the Gaza situation. And he says, Currently, the ground operation is focused in the north, and Israel has told uh, residents of Gaza to move south. What will happen when we need to operate, when we have to expand the operation in the, to the south? I guess what will happen to the, what will happen in terms of the people that live there? Will we have, will they have to move somewhere else? Will we ask them to move somewhere else? Well, I, I, I was thinking about that <laughs> as well. Of course, the, the Israeli, the secret wish is to, move the Gazans into Egyptian, into Egyptian territory, making, turning Gaza into something very inhospitable by the end of the, by the end of, by the end of the war. Um, that's going to create tremendous tension with, with, um, Egypt. Egypt certainly doesn't, doesn't want them. Um, you mean t on, on the tactical, on the tactical, yeah. on the tactical, um, level? First of all, I, I I do think that um there's going to be a rush, a rush for the for the Egyptian to the Egyptian border, um but Israel will probably with the bulk of them have to move them to um to the north um, through through humanitarian until it deals with, uh, until it deals with with um with the south. I, I mean, Israel is going to defeat, I think, Hamas relatively, relatively quickly. But to to destroy the infrastructure is going to take is going to take a long time. Can you um, can you say a bit more about that? Because that's interesting. You're what? How? You, what? What's the distinction you're making between destroying Hamas and destroying the infrastructure? What do you mean? Um, destroying Hamas means that they'll get to they'll get to. Um, um, to the leaders, Sin, the, yeah, right, Sinwar and uh, uh, Sinwar um, and, and Muhammad Beis, um, either dead or dead or dead or alive, they're going to destroy tunnels with uh, with hundreds or even thousands of um of and and there's going to be a parade of of um P POWs raising their raising their hands. Which is very, very important for Israel, for Israel, um, for Israel to, to, to achieve. But mm -hmm. a good guerrilla, I, I mean, guerrillas usually, a, a, a guerrilla, Mao said the chief, the chief mistake that guerrilla, that guerrilla, um, fighters make is that when they begin losing, they, be, they begin getting brave and they encounter the enemy. No, a good guerrilla war, Warrior is supposed to be treacherous 
not rain. He's supposed to go into hiding, into hiding. And many are going to go into, into hiding. I'm not sure that we have, that we have a profile of every, of every person. We probably have a profile of most of the, of the security, the security, the fighters in, in Hamas or the members of the security, security. I hope that we've been building this up over the past, over the past 20, 20 years. But there'll be thousands that go through the net and weeding them out, weeding them out. And, and, and the, the secret depots of, uh, that's going to take a long time. It took a long time, even in Judea and Samaria. I just want to remind, remind you after the 2002 onslaught, we reconquered in two, in two, um, stages. We reconquered Judea and Samaria. It was clear that terrorism was beginning to decline. It declined by 50% every yeah. year, but it nevertheless took to, to, till 2006. To really bring it, to br- really bring it almost to an end, to an end, and we never ended it completely. Mm. So, would Israel? When when would Israel? Accord, if things if things sort of transpire as you're predicting, when would Israel declare that the war is over? Meaning, when you know, when we talk about after the war, this and this is going to happen. So, after the war, we're going to have some kind of inquiry into what went wrong. After the war, I don't know, the, uh, I don't know, Benny Gantz will leave the coalition. All kinds of things are supposed to happen after the war during this, we have this temporary situation. When, when, the, when you achieve these three, these three scenes, the scene of a dead, of a Muhammad dead, dead or alive, um, thousands, some kind of evidence that thousands have been killed and, and, um, a parade of hundreds of um then then Israel will declare the end of the war because it declared war. So it has to declare it, it, it wouldn't have. It wouldn't it will declare the end of the end of the war. And then then there'll probably be American officials, um um international international coming into Gaza, talking to people, talking to a uh, potential technocratic technocratic um um leadership. But it, it, that's not going to mean that the war against um, terrorism is, is over, and it's never going to be over, probably. Um, right. As I as I said, it, it's never going to be over. Right. Uh, one final question, and then we'll we'll end. Um, there's a this is a it's a question from Joel Marx, who says that he's been wondering and worrying um, that. Hamas, because there's a Hamas presence also in in Judea and Samaria in the West Bank, whether they could also do something similar there, I guess to um, Israeli to Israelis living to Israelis living in the West Bank, I guess he means. Um, and if so, uh, firstly, what's the possibility of that or likelihood of that? And so, is it should Israel actually extend this operation to the West Bank and actually take this opportunity to preemptively sort of wipe out Hamas in 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 the West Bank as well. Okay, so first of all, I, I want to tell you that the most popular um, site um, had a survey uh, in the uh, West Bank site, um, Al-Quds, um, had a survey about what percentage, uh, uh, do you believe that an intifada will break out in support of Hamas? Hmm. But the fir- in the first days, 96% yes said yes, Four percent said no, and even today, eighty percent percent say yes. It's declined. Basically, the survey means it's, to read the results right. It really means: Would you like to have a to that a intifada breaks out? Right. That's the real survey, and most and most would love to see a an, an intifada. It's the prisoner dilemma that that prevents people from acting. In, in in unity, so I mean, most of the Palestinian population in the in 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 the Palestinian Authority do not like Israel, the Jews, or Zionists. Except that, except that as a as a fact. Um, so they want, they would like to have an intifada, but everyone hopes that the next guy next door 
will will leave, uh, will go down into the streets. The pro um, uh, now regarding Hamas, no, Hamas is hit. Hamas is hit every day, as I said, mm -hmm. during the day by Palestinian authority. They have ten thousand troops, well trained troops. They go in everywhere. They have they haven't gone into. Um, Janine, because they wanted Israel to bleed for political for political reasons, not because they couldn't do it. they couldn't do it. And we hit them every day. The Hamas openly acknowledges that that they hardly have an infrastructure hmm. um, in 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 the West Bank, so they can't pull off what they pulled off what they pulled off. I mean, maybe they'll be able to partially overrun a settlement. I don't. I, I can't even see that. I can't. I can't see that. Hamas is not is not strong. The jihad Islami is even less, and um, they're not a potential. They're not a potential threat. Yeah. To, to Israeli. Um, to the Israeli presence. I mean, they create threat. Um, they they create terrorism, and families are uh, grieve and, and are shattered. But that's it. Remains on that. On that level. Right. Okay. Um, well, uh, Professor Hillel Frisch, thank you very much for joining us and for um, giving us so much information and helping us understand better what I think, you know, it's one of those topics that we hear about, we see the headlines all the time and we might read about but not really understand the nuts and bolts. And you've really helped us get to the bottom of some of the questions that underlie those stories we, we read about the Palestinian Authority. And, it's, and as I said, it is particularly pertinent now. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you everyone uh, for being with us on the Zoom. We have another, um, the next installment of this series with GISS in two weeks time, uh, where we'll be joined by Dr. Aaron Lerman. Um, and uh, yeah, please join us for that. He's uh, he's also another another great scholar from the GISS. And, um, and you should absolutely check out the GISS website. It has a very good English website with lots of uh, articles and uh, material in English. So please do that. And if you're not on my mailing list and would like to be to receive information about our English events, then email me paulg at vegancenter.org.al. Thank you very much, everyone. For those of you in Israel, uh, stay safe. And actually, given the pictures I'm seeing around the world, maybe for wherever you are in the world, stay safe. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, um, we will, uh, we will see you in two weeks and, uh, I'm Israel Chai. Um, see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.